Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the panel Making Palestine Knowable, Marking Prevailing Discourses as Strange, Considering the Boycott of Israeli Academic Institutions. Uh, my name is Susan Slimovich. I'm a professor of anthropology at UCLA. This panel came together partly in response to the call from over 170 Palestinian civil society organizations, including the largest teachers and professors union, all, <clears throat> all in support of the boycott of Israeli academic institutions. Our discussions at last year's AAAs were catalyzed by the events in Gaza, horrific events in the summer of 2014, but the occupation and punitive home de demolitions are ongoing. This fall's ex escalation has again revealed the violence of the occupation and again confirms the urgency of the task at hand to end Israel's occupation and systemic violation of Palestinian rights. This panel engages with the possibility of an academic po uh, boycott and to make knowable the strangeness of prevailing discourses in the academy and in mainstream media through elucidating the, the elements of the construction of these discourses. The boycott of Israeli academic institutions is a nonviolent strategy that is part of a growing broad international effort to end Israel's impunity. In fact, the AAA task force on Israel-Palestine, which issued its research report this fall, provides a nuanced and devastating account of the human rights situation in Palestine. I encourage you to look at it if you have not done so already. The task force came to the unanimous conclusion, quote, there is a strong case for the association to take action on Israel-Palestine, but also that a mere statement censuring Israel is, quote, an insufficient course of action, unquote, given the gravity of the situation. We panelists share this assessment and support the call for an academic boycott of Israeli institutions as the best way to take action at this time. There is a resolution, Resolution 2, on the agenda for Friday's AAA business meeting that calls on the AAA to endorse the boycott. Resolution 2 applies the boycott to academic institutions only and not to individual scholars. It leaves individual members of the AAA free to determine whether they will apply the boycott in their own professional practice. It was also endorsed by the Jewish Voice for Peace. There is another resolution, resolution number one on the business meeting agenda that rejects the boycott while providing ineffectual criticism of the occupation. In contrast, resolution two proposes the boycott as a concrete way to take substantive action on Israel-Palestine and in keeping with the AAA task force's unanimous recommendation that the AAA take substantive action on this issue. We will be voting on both resolutions at the business meeting on Friday, 6.15 p.m., Convention Center, Mile High Ballrooms 2 and 3. Please come to show your support at what will be an important moment in, the, in our association's history. I ask you to vote no on resolution one and yes on resolution two, no on one, yes on two. If you'd like more information about the resolution and the task force re report, at the back of the room, we have flyers. Uh, there are two additional items I've been asked to speak to. AAA press policy forbids unauthorized recordings. Only officially contracted AAA vendors and working journalists with AAA approved press credentials will be permitted to record video or audio during the meeting. And there is a pr procedure for credentialed reporters wishing to record. They have to be accompanied by a AAA press office staff and have prior approval and consent on camera or in writing by individuals to be recorded. If you, anyone in this audience is using a personal audio video equi equipment, smartphones, digital cameras, audio recorders without prior permission from the AAA or without proper 
credentials, you will be asked to cease recording immediately. If you violate this request, you will be asked to leave the, sit the session. The Anthro, our AAA association, has received hate phone calls and emails from members and non-members concerning the association's engagement in issues related to the political situation in Israel-Palestine. I was asked, um, actually I wasn't asked, I have determined to announce that sitting in this audience at this session are additional convention center security staff plus an off-duty plain-clothed Denver public safety officer. I ask her or him to stand and be visible to the audience before the session begins. I can't see. The lights are in my eyes. Thank you. So I'm going to be begin with brief int introductions of all the participants. Each will speak for 10 minutes, followed by Q&A. So our first speaker is Saba Mahmoud, professor of anthropology, UC Berkeley. And I'm going to keep it short. So just two recent publications from vast, vast writings, uh, both out in 2015. One, Religious Difference in a Secular Age, a Minority Report, and the Co-edited Politics of Religious Freedom. She's currently working on questions of political violence and survival with a focus on Sunni-Shia relations in South Asia and the Middle East. Our second speaker, Amal Bashara, is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Tufts University. She is the author of Backstories, U.S. News Production, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, mess I'm messing this up, and Palestinian Politics. She's also the producer-director of the documentary film, Degrees of Incarceration. Some of her current research projects are on the relationship between Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank, as well as Palestinian popular politics in a West Bank refugee camp. Our third speaker, third from there, Ilana Feldman, is Associate Prof Professor of Anthropology, History, and International Affairs at George Washington University. Again, two recent publications, 2015, Police Encounters, Security and Surveillance in Gaza Under the Egyptian Rule, and the co-edited <coughs> In the Name of Humanity, the Government of Threat and Care. Her research focuses on the Palestinian experience, both inside and outside of historic Palestine, examining practices of government, humanitarianism, policing, displacement, and citizenship. Our fourth speaker is Sandra Hale, also number four there, Professor Emerita of Anthropology and Women's Studies at UCLA. Two recent publications are the 2015 edited Sudan's Killing Fields, Political Violence and Fragmentation, and um, the New Middle East Insurrections and Other Subversions of the Modernist Frame in the Journal for Middle East Women's Studies. Her research focuses on Africa and the Middle East, conflicts, social movements, and political, uh, and the politics of memory. She is the founder and coordinator of California Scholars for Academic Freedom. Our fifth speaker, Nancy Shepard Hughes, the end there, professor of anthropology at UC Berkeley. Two recent books, Commodifying Bodies, co-edited, co co and Violence in War and Peace, an anthology, her next book, The Ends of the Body, The Global Traffic in Organs, is to be published by FSG. Areas of research include critical medical anthropology, the anthropology of violence, madness and culture, inequality and marginality, childhood and the family, Ireland, Brazil, Cuba, South Africa. So our first speaker, let me welcome Saba Mahmoud. Thank you, Susan. I want to start by thanking the organizers of AAA's BDS initiative for the labor, thought, and effort they have put into bringing the issue of Israeli occupation of Palestine to, this, to the membership. I also want to thank members of the task force on AAA engagement on Israel-Palestine for the meticulously researched report released in October of this year. The task force has done the anthropologists proud by holding AAA's commitment to promoting critical awareness of the adverse effects of US policies around the world. In the short time allocated to me today, I wanted to focus on two objections that are commonly raised against the BDS resolution number two that is up for vote on Friday. 
One is the argument that targeting Israel is unfair when the record of other regimes in the region is at par with, if not worse, than Israel. So the argument goes, why single out Israel? A second objection is most clearly stated in the letter sent by the Israeli Anthropological Association and argues that in targeting academic institutions, we are targeting the enclave of liberal thought in Israel that is most critical of its policies toward the Palestinians. Let me address each of this argument separately. First, the argument that Israel's record is far better than that of other regimes in the region rings hollow. This is so for a, re for a number of reasons, some of which my colleague Amal Bashara will address in her comments. For me, it rings hollow because it rehearses an identical argument that was made at the time of the movement for sanctions against apartheid South Africa. Those opposed argued that South Africa's record on economic prosperity for blacks was far superior than that of other African states, as was its record on matters of fair and free governance. As one author who published an article in the Christian Science Monitor in 1989 wrote, and I quote, South African blacks possess uh, one of the highest living standards in all of Africa. Its housing is unequaled anywhere in the continent. Soweto is a proper city complete with schools, stores, theaters, and sports stadiums. In some areas, blacks drive their children to private schools in German cars. In South Africa, the literacy rate is 70% for blacks compared to average 40% in the 51 independent African states. The article went on to point out that unlike South Africa, in the rest of the continent, there were few checks on arbitrary actions by, rurals, by rulers and corruption prevailed because there was no strong political opposition and fr the free press was largely absent. The article concluded by asking why is South Africa being harshly condemned while black Africa is let off the hook. As you can see, this argument has many resonances with what is being said today by those opposed to BDS. What it asks us to do is to set aside the fact of Israeli colonial occupation and its system of apartheid rooted in the legal distinction between Jew versus non-Jew, akin to the distinction between white versus non-white practiced by the former Republic of South Africa. Instead, we are called upon to appreciate Israel's achievements. Importantly, this argument is premised on a geopolitical typology that divides up the world between the civilized and uncivilized, countries that are capable of promoting freedom, democracy, and economic prosperity from those that are not. The assumption is that the Israeli state belongs to the Western side of this geopolitical divide, that despite the violence and injustice it practices, like the former Republic of South Africa, it is superior than those other countries that are forever mired in their uncivilized, undemocratic ethos. Israel's record of worsening conditions for Palestinians notwithstanding, this logic implicitly asserts that progress is possible on the Israeli side. Palestinians will eventually be treated fairly in Israel, while other Middle Eastern states are in a permanent state of chaos, violence, and despotism. All Israel needs is a gentle prodding through open-ended dialogue as resolution number one proposes. We need to be cognizant of the fact that this geopolitical divide, of course, is created by the very rhetoric of Arab-Israeli exceptionalism that is at the core of the policies promoted by the United States and its allies. The, ge the geopolitical entente that exists on the ground between the United States, the Gulf states, Israel and Western Europe has made sure that this rhetoric of Israeli exceptionalism is kept alive, while indeed making it impossible for other Arab states to achieve democracy, economic prosperity, and the rule of law. I want to suggest that the BDS movement calls this very framing into question. It suggests that the exceptionalism of Israel lies not so much in its much touted democracy, but in its racialized character where non-Jews are excluded from its ambit. In its projects of expansion and conquest in historic Palestine, even as it claims to abide by international law. The BDS movement calls attention to the fact that Israel is exceptional, not because of its economic ingenuity, 
but because it is the favored recipient of U.S. taxpayer subsidy to the tune of billions of dollars that keep its apartheid system intact. Israel is indeed exceptional in that no matter what it does, whether it insults the President of the United States, flouts its foreign policy directives, it can continue to be the recipient of unqualified political, military, and economic support from both parties, Republicans and Democrats alike. So yes, the BDS movement, in my opinion, calls Israel's exceptional status to question, as well as the geopolitical typology on which it rests. Finally, let me turn to the second objection against the boycott of Israeli academic institutions, namely that it targets one of the few enclaves of criticism of Israeli policies. This is indeed the position most prominently expressed in the letter sent by the Israeli Anthropological Association in August of 2014. The letter was signed by 69 members of the, of the association, 40 voted in favor and four against with one ab abstention. What was surprising, of course, is the fact that never in the history of the Israeli Anthropological Association had it ever issued a condemnation of occupation of Palestine nor its discriminatory policies in the field of education. It is only in June 2015 that the association adopted a resolution condemning the occupation, while at the same time stating its opposition to the academic boycott on the table at this AAA meeting. And this was only after the task force had visited uh, Israel and Palestine uh, to execute its report. 74% of the association membership voted in favor of this resolution. Given that this is the first time the topic of occupation has been directly uh, addressed by the association, it to me is a sure sign of the importance of the BDS movement. If not for being forced to the table last year at the AAA, I doubt very much the Palestinian issue would have been given this attention. Rather than shutting down debate, the BDS resolution has sparked the long overdue conversation among Israeli academics. This is evident in the counter statement released by a group of Israeli anthropologists supporting the boycott movement. You can find the link to this statement in the AAA task force report uh, in footnote 58. It's worth reading. Finally, let me close by saying a few words about the notion of academic freedom that is being deployed against BDS. In the opposing resolution, number one on the table today, there is a sense that academic freedom is a sacrosanct principle or ideal that cannot be violated regardless of the context. It is akin to the American notion of freedom of speech that is largely a libertarian and highly individualized formulation. The notion of academic freedom, or this notion of academic freedom does not acknowledge the material conditions of politics and power that condition its exercise. The resolution to boycott Israeli academic institutions focuses our attention on this structural inequality. It highlights the vastly inequitable division of resources between Israeli and Palestinian educational institutions where the former are allowed to flourish and the latter are made to starve. It condemns the constant harassment of Palestinian students and faculty through intimidation and a system of arbitrary arrests and imprisonment. It requires that Israeli academics take action against the prohibition on speech and the memorialization of the Nakba. It encourages them to agitate against the Israeli prohibition on the circulation of books in the in West Bank. As the task force report documents, Israel completely controls the books that enter the West Bank as a result of which most books published in Arabic cannot make it into the West Bank. Even books donated by U.S. universities to Birzeit University are blocked. To quote the report, Israel blocks enough books from coming into Palestine that it has created a situation where books are falling out of Palestinian culture because they are not accessible, end of quote. This to me is an exemplary instance of muzzling thought before it even becomes speech. When the B, what the BDS movement has done is force us as a community of anthropologists to finally open our eyes to the systemic inequality that our government, our tax dollars, support with hardly a peep from the intellectuals who are supposed to be the conscience of this society. 
the fact that after years of being muzzled, we can speak openly about the harassment so, much, so many of us have had to endure on US campuses as students and faculty is to me the clearest indication that what BDS does is to make academic freedom a material reality that rather than a haloed and a hollow virtue. Thank you. Okay, great, okay, great, thanks. No. There we go, no. Hmm. Is this disappearing? Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. All right, there we go, oh, great. Thank you, what a, what a wonderful start to this discussion. And I also want to thank the organizers of this panel and the task force for such um, incredibly thorough report on these topics. I wanna to take on the theme of the familiar and the strange by reconsidering a very common um, theme that we hear often in media, um, that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East or you know, even cutting out the only, that, that Israel is a strong and vibrant democracy at all. Uh, and I wanna focus on freedom of expression in a so slightly broader way than the academic freedom issue, which um, is covered so extraordinarily well in the task force report. Um, uh, there's a key quote from the task force uh, on this topic um, from uh, an interviewee, uh, an Israeli interviewee who says, I wouldn't say Israel isn't a democracy, but it's a democracy for Jews only. This of course is a, is a major, major <laughs> um, qualification on the uh, concept of Israel being a democracy. Um, there are 1.4 million Palestinian citizens of Israel, and I wanna start by thinking about the ways in which um, their freedom of expression um, as, as individuals and as a collectivity are restricted in Israel today. Um, and I should say that there are 50 laws that restrict Palestinian citizens of Israel, and many of them do have to do with um, free speech and uh, political expression. Um, so I wanna talk about a, key, a few key laws, but I also wanna talk about how official statements and other forms of public action all together create an atmosphere in which Palestinian, possibilities for Palestinian representation are extremely attenuated. Uh, and again, both for individuals and um, collectives, as a collective. Um, so first of all, um, there have been, there are laws against incitement in Israel, but these laws are used uh, exclusively against Palestinians. In recent years, we see um, many Palestinians being arrested for Facebook posts, uh, and um, at, at a time when um, you know, there's quite a bit of incitement against, for violence against Palestinians, and no Israeli Jews have been arrested for those similar incitement posts. Um, this is a picture of Anas Khatib, who has detained, who's been detained since October 16th. Uh, he will be detained until November 16th. Um, in, uh, in Akka, in, in Acre, in the north, um, for Facebook posts that he made, which were, uh, you know, alleged to constitute incitement to violence and terrorism. The most post, the most likes that any of his um, posts got were 70. They didn't lead to any actions, and these were things like, Jerusalem is Arab, long live the Intifada, I am on the waiting list. Um, and again, these kinds of, um, you know, the limitations on speech that we find um, in court cases also affect the atmosphere pa for Palestinian expression in, in general because we've seen Palestinians during the Gaza War of 2014 being um, fired for their jobs also for Facebook posts that they were making. Um, the Nakba law was already, uh, Saba Mahmoud already alluded to the Nakba law um, which um, uh, authorizes the reduction of state funding to institutions that commemorate Israeli Independence Day as a day of mourning. Of course, the Nakba, the word Nakba refers to um, the catastrophe, is the word catastrophe in Arabic. It refers to um, Palestinian memory and history of 1948 as a time when 750,000 Palestinians were made refugees. Um, another 100,000 uh, 100, or so um, were displaced internally inside the borders of what became Israel um, and the destruction of Palestinian society. So um, commemorating, that, commemorating that history um, is now um, you know, very um, limited in Israel. Um, the law of political parties from 2002 prohibits registration of parties which, in their platforms, deny the existence of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. 
Um, so in, so in certain senses, this whole conversation that we're having about Israel being a Jewish and democratic state, the conversation here about you know, limitations on Israeli democracy are themselves uh, limited inside Israel. Obviously, there's a difference between you know, me speaking to you as an individual on a party platform, but nonetheless. Um, and this has led to uh, you know, extreme constrictions on Palestinian political expression. Um, this is Hanin Zorbi um, from the Tajam or, or Bella party. Um, uh, she's a really important um, figure. You can see here how she is thinking about democracy as um, the tyranny of the majority in Israel. Um, and um, in March 2005, in the March elections um, from this year, um, there were major movements to disqualify her from participating in the elections um, from the Likud and Israel Betenu party. And um, uh, there was also, like, uh, former foreign minister Avigdor Lieberman, Lieberman also launched a campaign, Hanin to Janine, um, advocating that her citizenship be stripped. And you know, there were public allegations that she was a terrorist and all of these other things. Of course, none of these things are backed up because if, if she'd been involved in any Ill illegal activity, you know, there's no, no question that but she would have been arrested for that, those kinds of allegations, particularly in this atmosphere. Just two days ago, um, the northern branch of the Islamic movement was outlawed. This has, um, you know, and the, the head of this movement is um, Sheikh Ra'ad Salah, who's a three-time mayor of Umm al-Fahim. So again, we see that Palestinian leadership from many, many sides of the political spectrum um, is being forced out of the public sphere. Uh, po Palestinian political expression is being criminalized. Um, and then uh, just to touch again on the issues of education, this is um, a, a still from the movie The Time That Remains by Elias Soleiman. Um, but um, the broader point being that um, uh, you know, the public education system in Israel marginalizes Palestinian you know, voices and histories and also underfunds Palestinian education. Um, the state provides three times as much funding to Jewish students as to Arab students. Um, okay, so now the, the second way I wanna make strange the idea of Israeli democracy is to ask where is Israeli democracy and where should we look when we want to find geographically the boundaries of where Israeli democracy is. Um, uh, Israel is, is the sovereign, you know, not only in, you know, Israel, uh, Israel proper or the, you know, uh, but also in the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, so here's a quote from Haggai Al-Ad, uh, the head of B'Tselem, um, who points out that, again, um, Netanyahu was using scare tactics, um, uh, talking about Arab citizens flocking to the polls in droves, a clear effort to cast the voting of one-fifth of Israel's citizens as a danger to be counteracted. That undermined basic democratic principles, but it paled in con contrast to the status of the Palestinian population living next door in territories under direct or indirect Israeli rule. They have no say at all in choosing the government of the occupying power that is in ultimate con command of their fate. How can we think about um, Israeli democracy um, in those conditions um, where um, four million people um, uh, have no way of participating in their own government? Um, okay. So uh, very briefly, I mean, there's so many ways to talk about this, including books, you know, uh, and so forth, but restrictions on Palestinian representation in the occupied territories. Um, a recent report, 2014 report from Amnesty International talks about the ways in which um, peaceful protest is extremely attenuated in the occupied territories, um, and Israeli forces have a long record of using excessive force against Palestinian demonstrators in the West Bank. In the year before this report was issued, 14 Palestinian protesters um, were shot and killed. Um, uh, and these uh, shootings of protesters, um, they also, shootings of demonstrations also include shootings not only of protesters but also of journalists. Again, a, you know, two forms of limitation on Palestinian expression. Um, and um, uh, I wanted to point out also the way in which, if we're thinking about incitement, um, this is Daniel Seaman. Uh, the head of the Israeli government press office from 2002, um, giving a reason for why he was stripping Palestinian journalists of their um, press accreditation cards. Um, so he's here using the term, you know, that Palestinian journalists are using every method to hurt us, including exploiting the media and Israeli democracy. We have to put a stop to this matter. So he's using the key word of Israeli democracy here um, as a way of uh, stripping Palestinian journalists of their ability to speak. Um, and further on the line of incitement, this was his response to the uh, shooting and the death of um, Italian journalist Raphael Sirello. I'm more afraid that an Israeli soldier will not shoot in such a situation and get killed 
than I am that the journalist will get killed. Now, Daniel Seaman did not usually issue responses in response to, or issue statements in response to the death of Palestinian journalists, who were actually the vast majority of journalists who were shot during this period. Um, but you can see here that this kind of a statement, obviously, um, created from the, uh, from the director of the Israeli government press office that issues the press passes to the foreign journalists, um, you know, creates an atmosphere, obviously, of impunity. Um, and journalists and soldiers were not held accountable um, for these shooting deaths. Um, Twelve journalists were killed in the occupied territory from 2001 to 2012. Seven journalists were killed during the 2014 attack on Gaza, mostly in airstrikes, okay? Um, this is uh, from the Committee to Protect Journalists. The interesting thing about this, in, the, in addition to the tragic deaths of these journalists, um, CPJ notes in the same article that this does not include eight other journalists who were killed during the 2014 attack on Gaza. They add, literally in parentheses, at least another uh, eight journalists were killed while not working, the majority of them from Israeli bombardment of their homes, like many other civilians in Gaza. As a press freedom organization, CPJ focuses on the journalists who are killed in the line of duty. Just as the, pre the, the, the task force says, um, has a, a, a passage from a Palestinian academic who says, I'm not being prevented from moving and doing my research in Jerusalem because I'm an academic. I'm being prevented from moving because I'm a Palestinian. Likewise, these journalists did not die because they were journalists. They died because they are Palestinians. But obviously this constitutes a major, um, you know, uh, restraint on Palestinians' ability um, to express themselves. Um, I want to move towards just a series, again, uh, just, I, I'm feeling very contemporary this week. So. <laughs> This is from a series of video stills from uh, a field site that I work in, Ida Refugee Camp. These are the conditions of dialogue on an everyday basis in Ida Refugee Camp. Um, so here's a, um, an eight-year-old boy who has been detained by the soldiers. Um, okay, so a man comes to try to retrieve the boy, and he's speaking. Um, the soldier begins speaking to him, uh, and then grabs him and detains him for several hours, okay? These are, these are the conditions of dialogue. When we think about dialogue and the uneven playing field for dialogue, uh, you know, for me, these are the moments that, that come to mind. Um, um, and also, you know, there's an incredible, also in my field site, there's an incredible amount of use of tear gas, uh, which prevents one from breathing, and certainly that prevents one from speaking. Um, so, just to conclude, there will be no free speech until occupation ends, until Israel changes these discriminatory laws and stops these violent practices that all together, you know, um, uh, imp you know limit Palestinians' uh, expression and also uh, stop impugning Palestinian speech as violence, which you can see through Daniel Seaman's uh, passages. Boycott is an important tactic for us to call attention to the ways in which speech does not exist outside of a relationship to state power, um, and so while its effects on the ground may be modest, academic boycott makes a very important statement, refusing the enta entanglement of speech and violence, and puts pressure on in individuals and institutions. But the truth is that nothing we can do can reverse this atmosphere um, of, uh, in which Palestinian speech is limited and, until the political situation on the ground changes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you all for coming um, to the session today. Um, I want to talk about another aspect of the sort of familiar strange dichotomy that we're working with here. When I talk to people uh, who oppose the boycott proposal, sometimes people who are on the fence about it, very often the first issue that people raise is about the effect of the boycott, the possible effect of the boycott on Israeli scholars, whether it might harm them and their academic freedom. And this is, of course, never mind the fact that the boycott is resolutely focused on institutions, not individuals, and that Israeli scholars will continue to be able to participate in the life of the profession and in the AAA. Nonetheless, the first question that is asked is often about Israeli academic freedom. So in this context of making the familiar strange, I want to focus not so much on this misreading of the boycott, whether it is accidental or deliberate, but on the question 
about why people's questioning begins with the effect on Israelis. Why do discussions about the boycott not start by asking about the Palestinian perspective and about its potential effects on Palestinian academic freedom and on justice for Palestinians more generally? Leaving aside, for now, those who simply do not care about Palestinian lives and who are interested only in Israeli efforts to maintain the unjust system currently in place, I think that we need to recognize a tendency among Americans, including many anthropologists, to read Israelis as familiar and Palestinians as strange. That is, Israelis as somehow near to us and Palestinians as socially distant. And I think that this can be the case among people who are sincerely concerned with the plight of Palestinians under occupation and inside Israel. So to put it simply, Israelis are often read as our colleagues about whom we have to have professional concerns while Palestinians are not. But I think that it is only from a starting position that does not give equal value to Palestinians that one could raise questions about the effect of boycott on Israeli academic freedom with no serious attention to the egregious, systematic, and often violent suppression of Palestinian academic freedom that is part and parcel of the occupation. And as I said, I don't think that it means that people operating within this paradigm have no concern for Palestinian lives. But this concern is often expressed in the language of aiding and of helping people who are not ap apprehended as compatriots. And this kind of problem bears a lot of resemblance to things that I think we're familiar with as anthropologists, like particularly Johannes Fabian's account of the denial of coevalness in anthropology. And of course, it has its own particularities. Israel, like the United States, is a settler colonial society. The narratives and tropes that a majority in both places use to describe their histories are similar, and I think this can breed familiarity. People also often read Israelis as white, like unfortunately still the majority of US anthropologists, but they do not read Palestinians that way. And of course, it is empirically the case that most Jewish, Isra Jewish Israelis are, like Palestinians, Arab, Mizrahis and also the case that Ashkenazi Jews have not always been read as white. But these facts are not part of this effective field of similarity. People also see Israelis as part of a broad Judeo-Christian culture, while Palestinians are seen as part of the Muslim other. Now again, it is empirically the case that Palestinians are Christians and Muslims. And it is also the case that these kinds of presumed cultural affinities are historically constructed in relations of power, and there is nothing natural about them. But these facts are not part of the affective field of difference. And these affective conditions have often underlaid political support for Israel's occupation, but they do not necessarily disappear when people become critical. And I think that there are very serious consequences of these smuggled in hierarchies of value. And I should say that my aim in calling attention to these problems is not to argue that we simply flip the binary and call Israelis strange and Palestinians familiar, though I would very much hope that we would want to identify a commitment to occupation and colonization as strange or something that we would want not to be a part of. Rather, what I'm suggesting is that we need to destabilize these often unwitting distinctions in order to ask the right questions about an academic boycott. By approaching Palestinians as our compatriots and allies, by truly considering them equals and equally part of our scholarly universe, we can start by asking, what are the obstacles to Palestinian academic freedom and to flourishing in general? What role can we play in acting against those conditions? recognizing our special complicity as American citizens, I recognize not all of us, but many of us, um, whose government supports Israeli oppression of Palestinians. And what have they asked of us? What forms of horizontal support in the struggle for justice have they called for? And on this, the answer is crystal clear. An overwhelming majority of Palestinian civil society organizations and unions, including the Palestinian Council for Higher Education and the Palestinian Federation of Unions and University Professors and Employees, right, the full swath of Palestinian universities, professors, and students have asked that we engage in a boycott of Israeli academic institutions. 
Of course, recognizing this call is not the end of our own deliberations. We are independent political actors. But if we acknowledge Palestinians as compatriots, we will give this call the weight it deserves in our deliberations. And my judgment is that supporting and joining an academic boycott as one tactic within a broader array of international and Palestinian tactics to resist the occupation can play an important role in affecting change, both in Israel and Palestine and here in the United States. And in fact, a great strength of boycott as a tactic is precisely that it has multiple audiences and effects. It speaks to the Israeli public, which is in a direct position to demand change from its government. And, to say that the, and says to them that the world says no to occupation and injustice for Palestinians. But a boycott also speaks to the American public and government and says that we refuse complicity in Israeli oppression and demand a change in US policy. And it speaks to our Palestinian colleagues and says that we recognize and respond to their requests of us. Boycott can productively shift action and relations to a plane of solidarity enhancing horizontal connections in a struggle for justice rather than hierarchical relations in a project of development. So recognizing this pervasive and systemic problem of hierarchy of value attached to Israelis and Palestinians, it becomes easier to make sense of aspects of the anti-boycott campaign and resolution. I think it is only from a starting point that does not give equal value to Palestinians that one could launch a call for dialogue, as the anti-boycott resolution does, that has no Palestinian involvement, that ignores the significant Palestinian call for boycott, and that seems to believe that dialogue must take place in Israeli institutions from which most Palestinians, those in the occupied territories and in exile, are entirely barred. So what on earth kind of dialogue could this be? Now the boycott, on the other hand, precisely by destabilizing comfortable institutional arrangements that can only ensure Palestinian exclusion and denial of rights, the boycott creates possibilities for real engagement between Palestinians and Israelis. The very best way to strengthen anthropological engagement with Palestine and Israel, as the anti-boycott resolution calls for, is to take serious action to pressure Israel. Only then might there be an end to the restrictions imposed by Israel on Palestinian movement that impede Palestinian research and educational activity, including access to the AAA and other international scholarly bodies, and could end restrictions imposed by Israel on access to the Palestinian territories and Palestinian universities by international scholars, including anthropologists and could end campaigns of intimidation in the United States and Israel that seek to shut down critical voices, both scholarly and political, on Israel and Palestine. Without freedom of movement, freedom of access, and freedom of thought, the anti-boycott call for strengthening engagement is meaningless. Fortunately, though, despite all the obstacles created by Israeli policy, Many international anthropologists working in, the, in U.S. institutions and around the world, and Palestinian scholars, anthropologists and otherwise, have been working hard for decades to research, debate, and teach on the situation. And by an overwhelming majority, scholars who are specialists on the subject and on the region more generally support the boycott. And this support grows out of what we know from our research and experiences. So if scholarly engagement has something to say about political tactics, in this case, it says boycott. The call for boycott begins from a position of presumed equality of value of Palestinian lives and seeks to contribute to the struggle for justice for Palestinians. Thank you. Usually roundtable presentations don't have titles. If this one had a title, it would be U.S. and Palestinian academics and public intellectuals in dark times. Whose academic freedom? We're fortunate, as, ha as has already been mentioned by Susan and, and others, uh, in our timing today because this roundtable has been greatly 
enabled by three relevant and very effective reports that have been recently issued from well-researched and authoritative sources, and in one case from the inside, so to speak. The National Lawyers Guild with its Palestine legal branch in conjunction, in conjunction with the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Jewish Voice for Peace, and the AAA Task Force have all given us enough evidence to support an academic boycott of Israeli institutions. Besides, within Middle East anthropology, scholarship on Israel-Palestine is one of the largest sub-areas, and the overwhelming majority, is, as has already been mentioned, of the anthropologists of the area support the boycott. We have, however, paid many penalties for this stance, and I have been asked to address that. By implication, our nonviolent pressure and academic boycott is an attempt to force the powerful, that is Israel, to cease not only the occupation, but the violation of the academic freedom of Palestinians, the occupied. Following the conference theme of making the strange familiar and the reverse, I make only brief points about the ways in which those academics and others who were opposed to the boycott of Israeli academic institutions have tried to render the quite straightforward discourse supporting the boycott movement as strange, also repugnant, inappropriate, etc. They've partially accomplished this through their distortion of the meaning and practice of academic freedom and through their attempts to turn the situation on its head. That is, through a sleight of hand, proponents of the boycott are accused of trying to violate uh, Israeli academic freedom while simultaneously claiming that proponents are anti-Semitic, an accusation all too familiar to so very many academics working in Middle East studies. In this convoluted interpretation, anti-Semitism takes on a strange new meaning, that is, anyone who engages in the criticism of the policies of the government of Israel. Does that mean that our students and colleagues are to be deprived of academic critiques of the policies of the State of Israel? Is it the case that our students and colleagues are not to hear them? Are these academic criticisms of Israeli policies to continue to be deemed strange? As the coordinator, founder and coordinator uh, for the last nine decades, nine decades, yes, right. <laughs> I'm feeling old, but not that old. Um, the last uh, nine years of California Scholars for Academic Freedom, I'm going to briefly present some examples from the experiences of academics at the University of California with an emphasis on UCLA, my own school, and the beleaguered status of faculty and students connected to Middle East studies and events on UC campuses uh, for a much more thorough and wonderful analysis. Um, I'm sure all of you know that Stanford has just published the politi Anthropology's Politics uh, written by Lara Deeb and Jessica Winninger. Uh, I really re recommend it. Well, let me tell you about California Scholars for Academic Freedom. It's a group of over 150 professors at universities and colleges throughout California. Um, I formed the group um, when I did because of various violations of academic freedom that were arising from the post 9-11 um, climate of civil rights violations and the increasing attacks on progressive educators by neoconservatives. As we know, many of these attacks have been aimed at scholars of Arab, Muslim, or Middle Eastern descent or at scholars researching and teaching about these communities. Eventually, our goal of protecting California scholars grew broader to include threats to academic freedom across the United States and globally. It is a sad testimony that a vast majority of the cases that we've acted on have been related to Middle East studies and including student activists working on behalf of Palestinians or other um, Middle Easterners, especially Palest Palestinians and especially issues of Palestine. Palestine Legal of the National Lawyers Guild too has stated that in the 18 months that they did intensive research there were 101 cases of academic freedom violations in California alone, far outnumbering any other state. As we would expect, in general, the number of cases greatly accelerated after 9-11 when so many people's civil and human rights have been violated with academic freedom underscored. Uh, although we should not mix free speech 
uh, with academic freedom legally, and I don't have time to distinguish these, I've had to conflate them. Among the groups with which we scholars and public intellectuals who focus on the Middle East uh, have had to defend against our AMCHA initiative, uh, Accuracy in Academia, the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and Stand With Us, Campus Watch, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, uh, the so-called Brandeis Center for Human Rights, and a number of others. Uh, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with these. Clearly, there's been a new wave of oppression. More than ever, this is a time for liberation pedagogy in our classrooms and in our roles as public intellectuals. The current crisis before us in higher education, which is so closely linked to the Middle East and to criticisms of Israel, is to a large measure a result of US government, government's uncritical support of Israel, not to mention the oppressive 9-11 atmosphere. And we can expect another one now. It's an important, it's an atmosphere in which, for example, there was a 2006 firing of a Roosevelt University in Chicago lecturer because of a statement made by a student in his class that Zionism is racism. The supposed offense of the instructor was that he did not silence the student. And are we to think from this case and others that the lobbyists not only want to silence us professors, but also use us as tools to silence our students? Even the AAUP, which claimed in 2003 that this was a time for more freedom, not less, caved into pressure from a Zionist lobby group and canceled a scheduled conference in Bellagio, which was to debate the concept of boycotts with special reference to Palestine. The lobbying group did not even want to have the debate go on. Simultaneous with attempts to call attention to the need to protect academic freedom, <laughs> protect academic freedom now more than ever, uh, neocon um, activists and Zionist lobbyists are on the rise. David Horowitz claimed that there are 50,000 professors who are anti-American and identify with terrorists. Um, such claims are usually based on support of Palestinians. To uncritical supporters of Israel like Horowitz, being critical of Israel is the same as being anti-Semitic, which to him is the same as being anti-American. In 2007, Horowitz suggested, or organized rather, an Islamo-fascist alertness week on many campuses. We had such a week on our campus. At UCLA, we've had our own set of experiences. I don't have time to more than mention the Dirty 30 list of UCLA's supposedly most dangerous professors. I'm proud to be among them. <laughs> Akin to Horowitz's list of 100 dangerous professors. I could also mention Scholars for Peace in the Middle East and its work in trying to influence the UC Regents to get the administration to monitor classes for anti-Israel content. Susan Slimovich and I were the objects of a direct attack by someone in our own department. The legacy of these efforts is that the UCLA Chancellor is investigating the atmosphere for Jewish students on campus, some of whom they say are feeling uncomfortable. This is the face of his um, ignoring our constant complaints. I'm sorry, this is the um, result of, uh, he's been ignoring our constant complaints about the treatment of Muslim and Palestinian students. Although UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies has through the years always had problems with outside lobbying groups whenever we did programming on Palestine, during the last few years, perhaps dating from a, a center panel held in 2009 uh, entitled The Humanitarian Crisis in Gaza, our center has been under unrelenting pressure from the pro-Israel lobby, one, one segment uh, uh, of which is Amcha. However, since 2012, we've, been ra uh, we've seen a ratcheting up of the surveillance and the harassment, and finally an all-out assault on our academic freedom by Amcha this time with the help of some Zionist allies, including the Brandeis Center for Human Rights, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, etc. This year's first uh, uh, Amcha campaign was not focused on UCLA alone, but consisted of a list of accused anti-Semitic faculty at various institutions throughout the country. It's no surprise, therefore, that in 2014, we were denied our Title VI grant. I won't. Um, comment on that. I'll just leave that little thought. 
got it. Um, let me conclude. As most of us would agree, the increasing infrastructure of surveillance, intervention, and control is creating an atmosphere of censorship and intimidation in general. And this has come at a time when there is an enormous institutional transformation caused in part by the commercialization and privatization of knowledge. Will we be able to maintain the academy as a semi-autonomous arena of critical inquiry toward the public good? Um, Bashar Damani is calling for a reconfiguring of the concept of academic freedom so that it can serve just as well in a world where war and systematic misinformation campaigns are the norm and where the free pursuit of knowledge is an exception. No matter if we define academic freedom as an individual right of free speech or as a professional privilege based on a codification of a set of understandings that allows faculty to regulate their affairs according to their own set of standards, we still need to ask if this academic freedom makes any sense in the context of the conditions of some societies, such as Israel occupied Palestine, for example. In other words, in the absence of critiques of professional norms, national identity, and hierarchical power relations. That is why when we observe a situation of an oppressed people under occupation, as with Israel-Palestine, where universities are complicit with the state in producing those very methods of, and tools of oppression, we have to speak out, not only for our own academic freedom, because now we know that it's also linked to uh, Palestinian active, um, academic freedom. So we're actually fighting for both of them simultaneously and I hope you vote accordingly uh, on Friday. Thank you. Hi, I'm very grateful to be here and to say that this has been a journey for many of us uh, to be here in this room and to take the opinions that we have. Um, I'm Nancy Shepard Hughes. I've, I was nicely um, uh, you know, introduced to you, but I've worked in Israel since 1997. I've made about six trips and I want to tell you a little bit about something, some of the things I found. I also lived in South Africa for a year and a half during the transition um, and came back to study the Truth Commission and I want to talk a little bit about that. So what I want to do in my 10 minutes, if I can do is maybe I'll, I'm gonna run through some slides. I'll try to say as little as possible because sometimes many of these are my, my images. The rationale for an academic boycott is about human rights violations and about war crimes. And I want to show you some of the war crimes that I know about personally. Secondly, about the problem of woundedness on both sides of the, of the divide in perpetrating human rights violations, what I call small wars and invisible genocides that result from the recycling of wounds. Third, I will also talk about Israeli exceptionalism by talking about not so much comparing apartheid with settler uh, occupation in Israel, because I, don't, I think it's wrong to use words that have very distinct meanings in the places. There are many other references. I worked in Ireland, and I know about Ulster as a settler colony. I know about California as a settler colony and the extinction of our Native Americans um, and South Africa. And um, how boycotts and sanctions, my last point would be, can lead to more speech rather than less speech. 
to collaborations. So I'm going to move through this as quickly as I can. So um, that's pretty much what I said. So why we should support. Where is there, the, is this a microphone? Can you hear me? Can I turn around? Uh, Palestinian colleagues and students need global support. My Israeli colleagues who have been writing to me <laughs> up until this morning uh, are being penalized severely for their dissent. I'm the mentor to two doctoral students in Israel, and they have begged that we vote on this because there is a real clampdown of academic freedom for them as well as for Palestine. Our U.S. faculty and students are being censored or they're self-censored. The boycott is a gentle, not a blunt in, uh, instrument. It's voluntary, it's largely symbolic, but shame is terribly important. That's really what we're talking about. And then solidarity in the face of injustice and social suffering is a dialogue we need. You know, um, the Black Lives Matter often, you know, talk about no peace without justice. Well, you know what? That was Dag Hammarskjöld who said that. But he added, no peace that is not peace for all. So this was uh, an event last um, September, a small demonstration of about 200 students at noon on the Sproul Plaza led by the Students for Social Justice in Palestine. There were calls for the UC administration to end its close collaborations with Israeli administrators and their poli the so-called political relations meetings, sharing policing and management tactics. That is, is very, very close collaborations. I won't go into the details. Um, there was no call for divestment, and uh, everyone was on a very tight self-control that I see as a kind of self-censorship that was really magnified by the fact that um, Israeli uh, dissenters against um, this demonstration, put themselves in a cage and put um, police um, you know, security tape around themselves and they taped their mouths to say, we can't speak, we're not allowed to speak. But they were censoring themselves. So these, we know these things. This is the task force. Please read it. It's a, it's a, uh, I was skeptical that a group could go and come back, but the continuing building of settler communities, the intolerable living, health, education, military assaults, the existence of death squads, the violation of human rights, passbooks, checkbooks, murders of students at Gazette University, the complicit role of the U.S. government and U.S. academic institutions in all of this. Okay, the seeds, unhealed wounds, I mentioned that. There's a sense of collective victimhood, a historical sense of woundedness. It's a primary agent agent of vengeance-based conflicts and of continuing wars, continuing conflict. Israel perceives itself as an exceptional Jewish nation forged after the Holocaust by a decree, this is what's been said to me, um, that sent Jews to Palestinian by Western nations who didn't want them. So they were forced into the land. That's one interpretation. Palestine harbors the permanent wounds of the 1948 Nakba, the exodus. So the question is, who's the killer, who's the victim? There's always a change of, and proportionality, proportionality. Here's just as in South Africa, where the anti-apartheid struggle was against the homeland, which had reduced the territory of the African, South Africans to less than 30% of the lands that they had. And you can see this. This is what's happening. It's very clear. All the, okay, this is just a few images. Normalization, I'm using Laura Nader. When the rule of law is illegal, the problem is the High Court of Israel has legalized and permitted land expro uh, expropriations, deportations, house demol demolitions, arrests without trial, and withholding food, water, electricity, and freedom of movement from thousands of Palestinians. War crime reports were rejected. One by my friend, Goldstone, who was a court and judge in South Africa, 
and did the report on terror and violence during the anti-apartheid struggle, was decimated when he did this report that accused Israel, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, of war crimes and possibly crimes against humanity. He was pistol whipped. I mean, essentially, he, he, was, he was made into a pariah. It was, it was the worst moment in this, this old, wonderful gentleman's life. Um, the two, 2014 UN report on the Second Gaza War reported that in addition to the thousands of civilian fatalities, 500,000, 28% of the population were displaced by the war and decimation of uh, health, sanitation, water. Okay, you could, this I used uh, the Palestinian Ministry of Health. You know, the UN has higher figures. The human rights organizations have higher figures. But let's take what the Palestinian, oh no, but also there's the Ministry of Health in the Jerusalem Post. Okay, that just proportionality, proportionality. And I'm using CNN and, and New York Times, you know, different figures. This is what it looks like. This is not my photo, obviously. This is what it looks like. So now is the time for the AA to engage in the untenable Israel-Palestine situation. The task force recommends that we engage, but leaves open the positions that we could take on the academic boycott itself. And I, and I just hope everyone will come. I changed my plans to stay here Friday night. Okay, the question of uh, South Africa, apartheid, and Palestine. I wanna talk about um, something that I think is very important. That is the role of university students, and particularly I'm taking very great pride in University of California, Berkeley, in pushing the uh, divestment and an academic boycott as well. 1985, 1986, hundreds and hundreds of students were battered, were put in jail, protested. They were joined by labor unions. They were joined by teachers. They were joined by, um, I was briefly detained with Jerry Berriman. Some of you know the great uh, Jerry. It was a wonderful time. And what happened was that it worked. It worked. It, uh, and, um, you know, how did South African academics feel about this? When I, some of my very dear colleagues did not think that an academic boycott was a good idea. But in fact, everybody benefited from it. And in 1990, Nelson Mandela, when he was freed from Parle, the last prison he was in, he came to the Oakland Coliseum. This was right after three, four years before he was elected. He thanked the Bay Area anti-apartheid struggle and he singled out the Berkeley students who were arrested and forced the divestment by the UC president. Here's some of the, we salute California for taking a powerful principled stand on divestment. We salute the International Longshoremen's Warehouse who refused to unload a South African ship. This was in concert with the University of California faculty student action for divestment. The longshoremen marched onto campus in solidarity with the students. The regents of the University of California voted to divest. We celebrate with you the Im imminent birth of a new South Africa in which all, at least we hope, <laughs> shall be free, equal, irrespective of race, color, gender, or creed. It was a wonderful moment. Why a professional political grounds for this? Anthropologists are on the ground. We have compelling narratives to tell, and we need a reformulation of narratives. We can do that. That's what we do for a living. We can identify parallels and differences between settler colonies. We can work openly and stealthily. We can make a difference, and here's the one difference that I collaborated with four people that made a difference with the, you'd say, I work on organs, okay? I worked on a collaboration to end war crimes against the bodies of the enemy terrorists. I've written four articles on this, which were not mentioned, called The Body of the Terrorist, The Body of the Enemy, uh, one with Donald Bostrom, and one with a secret writer who could not put his name on the paper. Okay. And with my advice. So, well, I, I am. I am. Everybody had a little more time. I just want to at least show you some of the images. I went to the Forensic Institute. This was considered a blood libel. It took me, a journalist, to shame me to finally come out and say 
in t uh, 10 years later what I had seen at the Forensic Institute. And that is, here's one of the people whose family I was representing. That is, everything was taken. Everything, organs, skin, eyes, skin sent to a military skin bank, so forth. So when are we, that's one of my pieces. So I released a tape with this man who and his staff. He was the highest paid Israeli uh, federal state person. And um, you know, he actually admitted it. This was one of the victims and I know the family. This is Rachel Corey. After being run over by this, she had her body also dismantled. Okay, here was the secret. Here was the secret. I worked later on with Dr. Colonel, a very strong Zionist, Ken Kugel, who was an inside whistleblower, trying, 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 trying. He lost his job. He got, you know, isolated by his family. That's why collaborations help. He came to Berkeley. He and I and the Swedish uh, journalist, and then with Maira Weiss, who lost her job in Israel because she was also reporting on false pathology reports at that institute. Today, my Ida Weiss has been appointed, after she lost her job for her politics, president of the Israeli Anthropological Society. She has been restored to her full, she was, she was um, dismissed on grounds of making up data. And many people still believe it, and it wasn't. It was they did not want her to write about this. What happened? In 2012, Hiss was fired, finally. He got his pension, but he's out. Dr. Kugel, the underground whistleblower, replaced him. I was with him last year. It was one of the happiest times when he brought me to show that's the container of body parts that he is repatriating. And you know what? It was not just Palestinians. It was everyone. It was everybody that came in there, soldiers, it was immigrants, it was um, even Orthodox people who absolutely object to the dis the, anybody they could take, they did. And so here we are, my ear device, and Ken and I, and that's the end. Here's what he says. There are no Jewish bodies. There are no Christian bodies. There are no Arab or Palestinian bodies. There is only one body, the dead body that I, as a state pathologist, is sworn to protect. So what I'm telling you is you can make a difference. You can work with people. You can work with students. You, the, the boycott is, why are we worrying about it? It is not going to change the world, but it begins a conversation. Thank you. Um, we have a little over a half hour uh, for questions um, to the panelists. Please keep your comments to a minimum. Please keep your questions short. There's a mic back there. Um, I request that you give your name since this is being recorded. And if it doesn't get picked up by the mic, they, I've been asked to repeat the question. Um, my regrets in advance, I will cut you off if you speak for more than a minute. This is to ensure the widest and most varied conversations among all audience and uh, panel members. Let me again remind you, uh, if you have to leave before the question and answer period, that there are copies of the resolution as well as facts and some highlights from the AA task force report uh, in the back of the room. So we hope to maintain an open conversation. Again, I repeat the question from the audience to make sure everyone has heard it. And most of all, so it will be clear on the official recordings for this session. Um, let's see, the vote on the boycott resolution uh, is at the AA business meeting Friday at 6.15 in the convention center, mile high ballrooms two and three. Please come and vote. Any questions or um, 
you have to come up to the mic, I'm sorry. And please state your name and the question. Ed Brown, a uh, retired professor of social anthropology at the University of Manchester. A male voice from a different generation than yours. UCLA PhD. UCLA PhD in Islamic studies a century ago. Uh, I first went to Israel as a visiting student in 1956 on the eve of the war. And I've been going back ever since uh, for various reasons. The last time, a report for the European Union on human rights in Israel and the occupied territories. I don't want to go beyond the one minute, but there are two things that strike me about the resolution. One, that it doesn't call to all anthropologists in the world, including Israelis and Palestinians, to support the boycott because it is in the interest of Israelis and Palestinians that this boycott works and has as much support uh, worldwide as possible. Secondly, uh, it must go beyond academics and institutions, cultural institutions. It must be a boycott of Israel in general, of its policies. And this is in a, in a situation in which Israel more than ever has been in absolute, is in absolute control of its territories, of the state and of the occupied territories. There is no threat to Israel. They are privileged and uh, in all ways. There are universities and Tel Aviv is a European city and that... Do you have a question? That, hide, that uh, height of, uh, of, of living has to be undermined. The question is, what do you think about mobilizing beyond American anthropologists to all anthropologists and uh, uh, not only universities but Israeli society in general? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Is, is, yeah, this is on me. Um, I will say that there is the, the resolution before us for the association is one action in a broad spectrum of both calls for action and things that can be done. The resolution is focused on what the, the institution of the AAA can and should do. However, parallel to that, there is a petition circulating that asks individual anthropologists, whether Americans or elsewhere, to participate in a boycott of Israeli institutions. So the resolution for the AAA accompanies a broader call to ask individuals to participate in a boycott. However, the resolution before the AAA is very specifically focused on what the AAA should do as a collective institution. It's important that it be focused in that way. Similarly, the call for academic boycott, both for the AAA as an institution and for individuals to participate in an academic boycott is one plank of a much broader boycott divestments and sanctions movement which precisely seeks to act against the status quo in Israel in a range of different ways. So I would certainly agree with you that it is important that our call to action be both global and be broad, and it is. Our resolution for here is focused on what we as a collective should do, and it, and it is necessary that it be focused in that way, but it is one thing, part of a broader call. Anybody else from over? Uh, also keep in mind that other American uh, scholarly associations have also come up with their particular resolutions. Quite a few have voted in favor uh, of boycotts, so it's going in uh, academic institution by academic institution in the United States. I basically agree that we should, at least in our boycott statement, invite Palestinians and Israelis to join the boycott. I know we're, we're very protective 
We're protective of our students. We're protective of our untenured faculty. We're protective of the Palestinians. We're protective, whatever. People have to take risks. They took risks. Mahira Weiss took risk. Ken Kugel took risks. South Africans took risks. Some very few, but a couple of academic anthropologists, uh, well, many were arrested, but two were, were murdered. So we have to stop trying to protect other people because it's protecting, we're trying to protect, I don't know what. I think we have to ask, I, I would like to see that on the, on the boycott, inviting and having more people to sign on, including members of the Israeli Anthropological Society. Sandra? Just a very quick statement to uh, follow on the heels of Susan's comment, or no, Alana's comment about a number of other academic associations are following suit. I mean, we, we know some of them. But let's think about Mesa. It's right across the street. And uh, let's try to put some pressure to bear on um, the Middle East Studies Association. Hi. <coughs> My name is Les Field. I'm from the University of New Mexico. And this is just a comment. Um, my colleague, Alex Lubin, who led the BDS uh, um, uh, uh, effort at the American Studies uh, Association, sent me this this morning, uh, saying that a watchdog group has named the University of New Mexico on a list of terrorist-friendly universities. Only 10 American campuses make that list. They include Harvard and other Ivy League uh, schools all based on administrative support for Islamic stu student groups. David Horowitz of the David Horowitz Center makes the case that UNM is a breeding ground for future terrorists and uh, denounces um, the Students for Justice uh, branch, um, Students for Justice in Palestine branch on campus, as well as the Muslim Students Association. And so um, what this will do is lead to increased activism at my university, and as we say in Spanish, aquí presente. Great. Anybody want to speak to that? Uh, there is a typology of what you're describing in your email that we're all too familiar with. A particular event uh, uh, will lead to a, partic a particular response in the American context. In the American context, the words that people here have talked about will get thrown back and forth. And then uh, clueless administrators will then talk about uh, civility and uh, a climate for students, usually at my university, all of the cl campus climate reports have been targeted at um, uh, the subject has been on behalf of Jewish students who are suffering or made uncomfortable by these kinds of uh, arguments. And there are many arguments, of course, against what, that, what a university should actually be. And we've heard some of it here. Anybody else? I just want, yeah, to me this kind of rhetoric is, is another, um, example of the way in which Palestinian speech especially, but you know, pro-Palestinian speech also is so often you know, determined to be violence or terroristic, right? Um, so even for example, there's a, there's a you know, as has been mentioned, it's illegal to support the boycott in Israel. Um, Netanyahu last June said of the BDS movement, we're in the midst of a great struggle being waged against the state of Israel, an international campaign to blacken its name. It's not connected to our actions, it's connected to our very existence. So the BDS struggle as, a, as an existential battle. Um, the bill sponsor who sponsored the bill um, against um, you know, illegalizing boycott uh, said that anyone boycotting Israel was employing terrorism. So again, you know, equating Palestinian speech with violence is a way obviously of trying to silence Palestinians and their supporters. Um, and uh, you know, we need to kind of hold fast on that line and creating ways for, for expression, obviously. Next, please, your name. Hi, I'm Dan Rabinowitz from Tel Aviv University. Um, I share many of the observations that were um, offered here about the situation in the, uh, on the ground. Those who know my work uh, would know that. And I also sh share the assessment that the emergence of BDS has catapulted the discourse and the awareness of Israel and Palestine in a very positive way. It's the leap of logic and leap of faith um, into boycott as the predetermined solution that I want to probe here. 
and I am aware that this is a bit of an echo chamber, but I'll try and do it any, anyway. Um, the pro-boycott -boy resolution for Friday says that the Israeli universities would be boycotted until uh, they stop their complete, they end their complicity uh, with uh, this uh, um, violations and the occupation, violations of human rights and, and the occupation. And my question to the panelists is this. Um, I am not sure um, where your respective universities would rank in the recent um, findings about the most militarized universities in the, in the United States. But could any of you say whether in 2015 your university is more complicit or less complicit than it was in 2010 with the invasion of Iraq? Could any of you say something about whether your university is more or less complicit with um, drone attacks or uh, Guantanamo or other violations than the university down the road? Um, and when you think about that, if you could possibly comment on how would you go about gauging that if somebody required you to do that, if you were on the, on the boycott review board and you had to go back to your own, your own university and say, yes, we are more or less complicit than we were or more or less complicit than another university down the road. This, is, this sounds like a technical question, but from the point of view of somebody who is about to be boycotted, the technicalities of putting forward a condition, which I think you can, you can by now see for yourself, I think cannot be met, becomes very, very germane for the whole debate. And this is not the first time that the boycott has positioned a, uh, a condition that cannot be met. It was done in the petition of 2014. I won't bore you with the technicalities. This is my question to the panelists. Okay, I'll, s I'll start by responding. Um, I can say, I teach at George Washington, my university is very complicit. Um, and I don't think it's actually very difficult in, in, U in US crimes. I think we're number four on the militarized um, you know, universities. It's actually not very difficult to ascertain the ways in which universities are complicit. And um, boy, just to step back, you didn't ask the question, how would I feel if people wanted to boycott US institutions or my institution? But I will answer that, which is I would have no grounds on principle to object to that. In fact, I would have every grounds on principle to support it. Boycott is a political tactic. It's deployed when it's likely to have an effect when, there, when the, the circumstances enable it. I think it's not very likely that, um, that U.S. institutions will be boycotted just because the, the U.S. is a hegemon and it's very difficult um, in our current geopolitical situation for people outside of the United States to choose to disengage with the United States. But it would certainly be a principled and reasonable ethical stance for people to choose to boycott the United States and to choose to boycott my institution. And I could not complain about that in the slightest. In terms of the question of how it would be, how it could manage the question of complicity of Israeli institutions, as I said, t tracking complicity is not difficult. And tracking an effort to stop being complicit would also not be difficult. This question is, off, is, is raised. Um, I think it's a bit of a red herring, this question of when would the boycott end. The, I think it's a bit of a red herring for two reasons. One, because we are so far from a situation in which Israeli universities are trying to be non-complicit. There is no attempt right now at an ins for Israeli institutions um, to end their complicity with the situation. Certainly individual Israelis engage in that, but at an institutional level there is no attempt. I would expect that, that if we give boycott divestment and sanctions and Palestinian efforts um, at resistance a chance to work, maybe the Israeli society will change and Israeli institutions will go along with it. That, that is part of the reason that we're pursuing this politics. If Israeli institutions chose to get ahead of their society, which I don't especially expect, but that would be a wonderful political development, it would be applauded. And I do not think that it would be difficult at all to render judgment um, when Israel, if Israeli institutions did in fact end their complicity. If the boycott passes, 
The AAA Executive Board is tasked with its implementation. I anticipate that they would appoint a committee um, to manage that implementation, but what, you know, actually putting into practice what that would mean for the institution. And as part of that, that there'll be a process um, for dealing with requests to end the boycott because of non-complicity. But we are so far from this being um, an actual issue on the table that I would suggest that we, that's not where the, the energy of um, working out procedural details be put at first, but it, it actually is not ac that difficult um, a, a, an issue to deal with. So I think um, if I, I would um, agree with Alana that if there was such an attempt put forward of boycotting institutions that are really deeply engaged with the, particularly with military technology and the support of military research at any of the American universities, I think many of us, including myself, would be at the forefront of signing that. I think politics is always a matter of actually moving with the demands of the time. That time that there would be a utopian moment when a socialist revolution would rise and we would actually then be able to change societies, that is, that is no longer the political horizon with which we work. And the immediate demand before us from uh, Palestinian academics, from Palestinian universities, from Palestinian students and faculty is that please, uh, this, 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 uh, this request to think about joining in solidarity with the BDS movement. It's not just Israeli institutions and academicians who would be, who would be affected by it. It would also be the little that uh, amount of exchange that Palestinian universities have, such as they are, um, is also going to be deeply, uh, deeply affect them, the boycott itself. But having said that, nonetheless, that call needs to be heeded. And that's precisely why BDS movement has gained momentum because there is an attempt at showing solidarity when all other forms of solidarity have been completely shut down. So that's uh, to say that you know there will come a moment when actually some strategy like this will crystallize. That moment cannot con continuously be deferred, which is what we have done. And a second issue is, you know, as a as an individual, I have refused to actually visit Israel, accept uh, invitations from Israeli universities. And I have often requested that my condition for, it, for participating would be if they actually had participants from West Bank and the occupied territories and Gaza participate. And almost every single time I've been told that that is impossible for, that, for Israeli universities to manage. This, this attempt has to go beyond the individuals. It has to become an institutional issue, otherwise, just random individuals saying that this, we will not do this is not going to actually really affect the status quo as it continues to be practiced in Israel. Unless there is an institutional attempt to change reflection, change debate, and countless colleagues of mine who, have, who were supporters of South African uh, boycott are actually engaged in back and forth with Israeli universities and what the BDS movement has done is to put that question on the table where we actually can debate not on the basis of individual reflection and ethical commitment, but actually saying there is a program here. There is a solidarity movement that is at stake. What do we do? Well, in addition to echoing uh, Ilana and Saba, I, I want to say that implied in your question is that uh, we're not already working against the militarization of our universities. I can't speak for everyone on the panel, but I certainly am. And this issue is not, this issue of boycotting uh, U.S. institutions is not new. Um, as an activist against the war in Vietnam, there was a call for a boycott of American institutions at that time and I was a part of that boycott movement. It didn't go very far, for one thing, the, the war was winding down, and, and, um, and, and so in a sense, the mom momentum was lost. But the mo momentum had been picking up. So there is, uh, there is a history. Uh, it's not a completely outlandish uh, notion 
although I agree with, with my two colleagues that this is not, this is not the moment. And um, no, I've said enough. Um, very briefly, could you speak very briefly? Could I speak very briefly? Yes, go for it. Well, who, who did you say? Nancy. Yeah, just, uh, just be uh, very quick because I want to hear what everyone has to say. But just one point uh, when you go to the Friday uh, to think about. That is, there is no call for doing a technical evaluation of one university and one administration versus the other. That, uh, it, it, that is not appropriate. A boycott, an academic boycott, as in South Africa, fell on Afrikaner universities, Zulu universities, because you had apartheid, on English universities. It fell on medical schools, theology schools. It fell on everyone. And, uh, th th and the, only, uh, the only profession that suffered, you might say, because everybody was in it together, were the archaeologists, which is a similar we haven't really talked about. Uh, a group of uh, South African archaeologists tried to go to a global or a world archaeology meeting and they were stopped. Uh, that was about the only, that's what I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a blunt instrument. It's a little bit about shame. Oh, uh, wait, I'm, uh, uh, excuse me. No, first he's going to ask, then you get to ask, okay? We, we fall, you're, you're right after him. You're, it's not a debate or an exchange. First, the speaker, then I invite you right afterwards. We can all hold these thoughts in our head. Thank you, my name is Kerim Merek. I'm an Egyptian student at Columbia. Um, I'd like to speak about a blind spot for BDS, <clears throat> which is uh, a bit hard for some Arab students to talk about, especially Christian Arab students, and that's uh, Christian Zionism. It's more often than not very hard to go to conferences. I speak for myself where there's a discussion of the Bible or such issues without being called anti-Semitic. Especially that's the case for Coptic Christians, especially Orthodox Christians. We're often just slashed with the back of the hand that we are anti-Semites. But would AAA consider at least some mechanism so that that not be policed? That, that that will not be, I'm sorry? Policed, the, the policing of the thought of at least Christian Zionism and its effects on other Christians. Does anybody Thank you. have any? Uh, the only thing I can think of is that there are several other panels that are, you know, we're just, I think we're the first one. There are several other panels that are trying to address different um, um, subfields, if you like, of the anthropology, um, larger discipline, archaeology, religious studies. And that, you know, that, that would be a question to bring up. I don't know how to answer it. Does anybody else? The, one other thing, that, uh, it's a more general response, which is that in, um, in enlarging the universe of what can be said about Israel, which the boycott does, um, it, I think provides, that alone provides protection for people from spurious charges of anti-Semitism that simply criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic. So if we create opportunities for more to be said, then ev more people will be protected. And I agree that it's a big problem. Um, in, in fact, when I was interviewed by the task force in terms of 10 years of uh, attacks on me, internet smears, things that everybody has, they asked me what the Anthropology Association could do, and I said, my best protection is if the uh, association passes this re resolution. Yes, so. this is not another question. It's a, a note on the answers I got. I got very intelligent and interesting and relevant uh, answers to a question I didn't ask. My question wasn't about how would you feel about boycotting American universities, which speaks again to the singling out Israel argument, which I've never been involved wi with. I'm not interested in that argument. My question was a technical one, and I didn't get an answer. Ilana said it's very easy to do what you're asking, but never said how it would be done. That was, that's, that's my note. I asked a question about how do you gauge the level of complicity of a university at a given time and over time, and how do you compare between them? I didn't get an answer. That's fine. It's a, it's a difficult question. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blaming anyone. Um, but I just wanted to note that this question is still up in the air. I actually disagree with you. I thought that the, 
the answer was quite specific that this is not secret information as to how our universities are engaged in the military research. I work at a public university and almost sing every single portfolio of research where, which, which has complicity with either military intelligence or development of weaponry and so on is very much available and you can go on the website and get that information. So I think in this technicality, that the supposed technicality that you are you're saying that's all it is, what you're asking is that given that complicity how, uh, of the universities in which we work, what is our political stance towards it and which is why, in fact, most of us try to address that question because just to find complicity, is, it's indeed not difficult. And if you're interested, we can sit down right after this forum and I can go through the website where I can show you all sorts of military projects. Some universities have more than others and we, we, this is public information, at least for those of us who work in public university. I don't want to belabor the point, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, would the panelists like to say anything to sum anything up or sum up their points? Come to the business meeting Friday, 6.15. Vote no on resolution one, yes on resolution two. Thank you all very much.